Due to violent, violent unpredictable nature of individuals in today's society, it must be understood that the method shown for products used for self-defense video may not work, work, work given a given situation. It is, it is the viewer's responsibility to comply with all laws in connection, connection with the use of these products and is advisable to keep children and animals away from all products. The pepper sprays offered by Help Fight Crime are extremely powerful police sprays. They are used for any purpose other than self-defense may be considered a crime. The use, the use of pepper, of pepper sprays is not, not recommended against individuals carrying guns, guns knives, knives, or other, other lethal weapons. weapons. These, These sprays, sprays must fully engulf, engulf the eyes, nose, and, and mouth of the attacker, attacker for full effectiveness. Remember, Remember to immediately vacate the area, area where, where you have sprayed the pepper, the pepper spray, spray, or otherwise, or otherwise protect, protect yourself from the fumes. The physical, the physical response, response to these sprays varies from individual to individual. individual. Viewers Viewer should, should be further advise continuous, continuous exposure, exposure to, to the sirens on the car alarm and the home personal alarm will cause serious hearing impairment. Let it be understood that you are fully indemnified to help fight crime in America and any of its representatives against any and all liability or injuries received from the use of the information or product in this video. Viewer you are further indemnified to help fight crime in America or any of its representatives for any special, indirect, incidental, or consequential damages included but not limited to the loss of life, Limb, limb, personal, personal or business, business income, income, physical, physical damages, damages, or any, or any other losses, whether, whether or, or not, not foreseeable. foreseeable. Help, Help Fight, fight Crime America, America will replace any defective product that is still within its warranty period, free of charge. With the country in a moral and economic downswing, with social programs and corporate America downsizing on all levels, more and more crimes will be committed against average citizens. This program is not intended to frighten you, but to help you develop a personalized plan of action, as well as to motivate you so you will put your action plan in place. In this program, Don Goldstein, one of the co-founders of Help Fight Crime America, will be discussing the three most common crimes and instructing you on the options that you have to protect yourself and your family. First, Don will discuss what to do when a criminal breaks into your home. Second, what do you do when someone physically assaults you? Third and last, what do you do when someone wants to carjack you or attempts to steal your car? It was a normal day at the office until about 3 o'clock in the afternoon when I got a call that my house had just been burglarized. Um, I went to the house to find that the police were just finishing uh, their duties there. What I did find out was that my neighbor across the street had gotten suspicious when she saw uh, three guys at the front of the house, one of which went to the back of the house, came back, got the other two, and all three went around back. So she became suspicious and called the police. The house was unoccupied at the time. I was at work, my wife was at work, and the kids were at school. Um, luckily, they were only in there for five minutes, so that not too much was stolen. But I quickly realized what the word ransack means, because it did not take very long. Uh, the police did catch one of the trio. The other two got away. Approximately, I'd say about three hours after that, um, I was talking with my neighbor because it bothered her that she saw three people go in the house, but only two come out the front door, which was visible to her. I explained to her that two came out the front and one came out the back, but it really bothered her. So I decided for my own peace of mind to search the house. <clears throat> Um, I went to my son's room, which was at the furthest end of the house, and much to my amazement, the first closet door that I opened, there was another pair of eyes looking back at me. Um, needless to say, it's, it's, a, it's a feeling that you can't describe. Honey, wake up. Did you hear that? What? What? Leave me alone. You're always hearing things. 
Oh, I heard that. I'll get Kathy in here. Hurry up and call the cops. What's wrong, Daddy? Where are we going? Stay in here with Mommy. Adam, the phone is dead. I'll be right back. No, Adam. Mommy, I'm scared. Shh, honey. Daddy will protect us. Hey, put that down. Why should this father have not gone down the stairs? He didn't know how many intruders there were. He didn't know where they were. He didn't know how they were armed. You never confront the criminal. There are far better options if you pre-plan. Let's start making your plan now. When a criminal comes up to the house, he's not looking for a house that's well lit. He's not looking for some place that's got alarms, signs out front. What he's looking for is he's looking for a home that's easy, it's an easy target, it's quiet, it's dark, some place that he can get in. Uh, the obvious, the one-inch deadbolt on the, on the door is very important. Uh, the handle locks that many people have are virtually worthless. They can be opened with a credit card. Uh, they should have underneath all of their windows shrubs that are low enough that the guy can't hide behind them, but made from, uh, for instance, roses, thorny shrubs that he wouldn't want to be climbing into that window or climbing out of that window with a TV or anything because he'd be getting all cut up. Uh, also, on the outside, uh, lights that come on automatically. Uh, by the way, there's lights like that uh, that are available under $30 from the, the home centers. Having those items outside is important. Also, when you have a, a dog, uh, criminals don't like coming up to houses with dogs. Uh, some people will put a, a dog sign out front and it'll say, beware of dog. Well, that's fine, except if um, you really do have a dog and all it says is beware of dog and a six-year-old or a five-year-old comes in and climbs over the fence and your dog mauls this kid, there's already been court cases lost because the child couldn't read beware of dog. So if you're going to use a beware of dog sign, make sure that it has a, a picture of a dog, uh, a, a snarling dog or a mean, vicious-looking dog uh, on there so that even a person that can't read can understand what the story is. Unfortunately, when you have dog signs, many people have them. So making it a little bit more realistic would be simply taking things like a large dog bowl outside of the house, uh, printing something, you know, Butch or Jaws or Mambo or some, you know, a tough name on it, but make sure it's a big bowl. And also at the bottom of your railing, put a dog chain and bring the chain up the side of the railing and up to a little hook by the door. That's where you put the dog out. The idea is let this guy really believe that you have a dog and the purpose of the dog is to bark and make noise and the guy doesn't want to come up. If you can think of it this way, the guy doesn't walk up to your house, you know, and come and bang on the door, bang, 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 yo, I'm breaking in. He doesn't do that and yet that's what your dog actually does. Uh, your lights as, as they come on suddenly flood the area with lights that wasn't lit before. Obviously that works well also. Okay, inside the house, um, doors and windows are really quite easy to secure and people who believe that their little latch on the top of their du double hung window is is sufficient it's just not true uh, things that you can do on those kind of windows is to drill a hole through the frame of the window the front window into the frame of the back window not all the way through otherwise you have an air leakage and just insert a nail in there and then even if the, the latch is undone or left undone the, the window can't be opened simply because of the nail uh, the worst kind of windows are sliding glass windows. Sliding glass windows, um, any variety, anything that slides. Uh, in fact, let's talk about two things at once. Sliding glass windows, sliding glass doors. Um, when you have shower doors, when you want to take them out, if you want to clean them, you simply lift them out of the track and take them out. Uh, medicine cabinet doors, same thing. You lift it out of the track and take it out. Well, a sliding glass door is no different. It's the same thing. It's a very large door. Um, that people think, because this, they've never heard this, that all you do is put one of those bars down or put a dowel stick on the bottom or a broomstick so that the guy can't slide it. Well, criminals don't slide the doors unless you've made it so easy. They'll just come up, they don't need anything fancy, they'll put their hands on the outside of the window, they'll push against the window, the, the sliding glass door I mean, or the window, they'll push against it, they'll lift it out of the track and simply push it in just like you would do on any sliding glass door. So what's being accomplished uh, by, by securing that door, the only way to accomplish securing that door is to 
either at the bottom of the door, drill a hole through the, the, the track on the bottom into the uh, door frame, the sliding glass door frame, or on the top, and this is uh, easy, easier for most people to do, at the top on the track, just simply take and put something above the door. In other words, slide the door out of the way, put a, a piece of molding or a dowel stick or something like that across the top, screw it into the top of the, the, the track, and then slide the door back. Well, obviously the door slides back and forth. You don't make it so far that the door can't come back. And then if the guy tries to push the door up, it can't go anywhere because it's hit that track and you've effectively kept him from pushing it up. The truth of the matter is that a house that has no protection on the outside, meaning that the guy comes up to the house and he's coming into this house, it literally has three times as much of a chance of being burglarized. If this guy were to walk up to this house and the very first thing when he opened a door or a window was there was blaring noise, he'd think one of three things happened. He'd either think that an alarm went off, the, the police were called. Well, it doesn't matter whether the police are called, but if the alarm went off, what's the criminal thinking when he comes up to the door? Well, maybe the cops are called, the family's up, if it's real loud, the neighbors are woken up, and then if he's going to come into that house anyway, what doesn't he know? He doesn't know where the family members are, how many family members are home, what they're armed with, so he goes a couple blocks down and he deals with another house. What if the phone is dead? It's a good question that people ask, you know, they're in a position where they're upstairs and they go to pick the phone up, and what most people think, quite frankly, is that the a uh, burglar is going to come in and this intruder is going to, you know, cut the wires outside. The fact of the matter is that when we talk to many, many of these criminals uh, who have actually been, you know, involved in these crimes, they're not, in fact, doing that. They're not cutting the wires outside the house. What they're doing is they're walking in, they're finding the very first phone that they can, and they're taking it off the hook. Now, obviously, we all know that that will disconnect you at all levels from being able to make a call. But what occurs is when he takes it off the hook, he doesn't just take it off the hook, he also takes the uh, handset and the cord that goes into the handset and he takes that cord out, he unclips it, so that 30 seconds later, mommy ears who's sleeping upstairs doesn't hear the doo-doo-doo-doo-doo noise, which wakes her up. The way to overcome that, of course, is to do one of three things. You can either get yourself a cellular phone, or you can have a second telephone in line installed only on the second floor. Both of those, however, cost money. They're both effective, they both work, but there's something you can do for free. Uh, what you can do is just take each of the phones in your home and they took the plug out of the back of the phone and you dropped it on the floor and this, this intruder comes in and he takes the phone off the hook. Obviously, that phone has nothing to do with the phones upstairs because it's not plugged in. Well, the guy wouldn't be too bright if he sees a phone with a wire hanging. So take the phone, put the phone down. But before you put the phone down, disconnect the cord, put the cord underneath, put the telephone on top of it. It looks like it's still plugged in when in reality it's not. Now, by doing that, if the guy takes that phone off the hook, you can still make the call out upstairs. On a wall phone, you need to push the phone against the wall and lift it about a half inch and it will come off the wall. Uh, obviously, that phone needs to be put away. In some instances, that will also disconnect the phone. The way to tell is just push your wall phone against the wall, lift it a half inch, and listen. If you still have a dial tone, then you're a person who has to take it off the wall and put it away for the evening. Um, if you have a portable phone, you need to take the base and put it up in your master bedroom. Keep the, the handset down in that area, in the first floor, so that that handset can be used all day. And then when you go to bed, take the handset up to the bedroom, put it on the base, it charges all night. And what you've got now is a phone that's being charged, it's taken out of that area, and it can't be disconnected. So we've got a, a, a phone that works, now we've got to call the police. Well, everyone knows call the police. If you have 911 in your area, obviously call 911. The problem is, that again, we're in a four bedroom, two story, everyone sleeping upstairs scenario. Uh, mom, who's freaked out, figures, well, my son always is on the phone, he must have called. And the son figures mom called, and grandmom figures mom called, and in reality, because you're all in different rooms and it's the middle of the night and there's fear and panic and chaos, nobody makes the phone call, everyone thinking everyone else did, or the opposite. Grandmom picks up her phone, the 18 year old picks up his phone, mom picks up her phone, and that works just as well. So the point that I'm trying to make is that prior to a, an emergency happening is don't say, well, we need to call the police. Decide who's going to make that phone call and make that part of your plan. The 
interesting thing is that people then, uh, when, they're, when they're putting their plan together, they bring everyone to a specific room. Where do they bring them usually? To mom and dad's room. Why do they bring them to mom and dad's room? Because, well, when we talk to all these thousands of families and we ask them, what room would you gather everyone in? They either said, because there's a lock on mom and dad's door, it's my room, uh, there's a telephone in the room, etc. Well, let me put you in the role of a criminal. If you're breaking into someone's home and you're looking for valuables, what room do you go to first? Well, if you're looking to take jewelry and money, obviously it's the master bedroom. So bringing everyone to the master bedroom typically is wrong unless the master bedroom is the room that has the escape route as in the form of a roof or a ladder that you can put up. Uh, the ladder I'm referring to, uh, $20, $30 in your home centers. You hook it onto your windowsill, you throw it out the window, and down you go. Now, many people during a seminar will joke and say, I ain't going out on one of those things. There's no way I'm going out on one of those things. You have a gun coming up the stairs, you'll go out in your underwear. So the point is, if you have no escape, if somebody's coming up after you, you need to have a, a, you need to have a resolution. And you need also to know where to meet. So now let's talk about, we know not to meet in the master unless that's the room to, to get out of. You need to, to wind up, though, in the room where the slowest person to, to rise is. In this house, the 87-year-old grandma would probably be that person. Uh, why? Think about your own grandmother before she'd come out of her house in the middle of the night. The robe had to go on. Maybe the slippers, maybe the teeth, maybe, you know, the, the hearing aid, but definitely an argument. What are we doing? Where are we going? What's going on? And please, if you're, if you're an elderly person, please don't be offended. The point that we're making is that you're not as quick to move at 2 in the morning as an 18-year-old would be. So my point here is this, that if, if there, there, there's a slow person in the house, you don't go and get that person and take them slowly across. Uh, let's take grandma out of the scene and let's have an 18-year-old and a 6-year-old. We've got an 18-year-old and a 6-year-old, both sleep heavy. Most families, when asked, bring everybody together into the 6-year-old's room, which means you've got to go wake up the 18-year-old, possibly have an argument with him or her, and take that individual to the 6-year-old when in fact the six-year-old, you don't have to do a thing, but pick the six-year-old up under your arm, put your hand over the mouth, down the hole, into the room, and it's quiet, and it's easy to do, and you've taken that person now into the slowest to rises room. So you've got everyone together, and from there you either escape or you can use as a last resort a fogger to keep that person away from that, that area of the house. One of the worst questions that people have to answer, and we ask this at a every seminar and everywhere I talk to people, is this. You've got all the security that you've done. You, you, you've remembered to unplug your phones or you've got a cellular phone and you've got the, the whole family together in a secure room and you've done all the things and the police have been called and they're on the way. You know, hopefully they're only going to be there in a matter of moments, but that's not the case in many areas. Uh, if you're fortunate, maybe they all will be only moments, but the real truth comes down to what if you what you know you've got more than one guy in the house you've got a whole series of people in this house and you hear him coming up the stairs well you're behind a door and you really have a pretty pretty bad situation you've got this this guy coming up the steps you don't know if he's armed or not you don't know who he is he's coming up maybe two of them maybe three of them coming up and you're behind a door that uh, you've probably seen kicked in in your house because it's made of very flimsy material or you locked yourself out of the room so you got a bobby pin and you put it in the doorknob and you open it up or a little screwdriver. Uh, obviously you should have a way out as, as we've discussed. You need to have a way out uh, with the fire ladder or a roof that you can go out on. But you know, if you're in the situation and you just, you just can't, you know, you, you need to put a barrier. Let's Let's just say the bottom line is you need a barrier. It would be wonderful if we were in the days of force fields where you could just put a force field up in front of this guy and he couldn't get up the stairs or he couldn't get back to your bedroom in an apartment or whatever. It wouldn't matter where it is. Well, you've probably seen on TV where the police shoot a tear gas into a building and out comes the guy. Well, something you can do similar is you could take the fogger and the fogger is simply a police strength pepper spray in a fog form made of red cayenne pepper. And as a last resort, you don't want to shoot this, you know, down your stairs because it gets on everything. And even though it washes out of most materials, it doesn't wash out of everything and it will stain. So let's put yourself up in a, a position where you're in the bedroom. If you know this guy's coming up, you know, or you, you, you know that you're, you've got a long wait for the police and they're in the house and you want to make sure they get out, just take the fogger. You take on the top of the fogger, there's a safety. You, you pull the safety off. 
You shoot the fogger down the stairs. When you shoot it down the stairs, within seconds it's engulfed to the whole first floor. And what's occurred here is that we now have a uh, red cayenne pepper at a million and a half heat units all over suspended in the air. The first thing you're going to hear downstairs is everybody choking their brains out down there. Now, if you've got family members that are on that floor because your house is laid out as such, that you have other members, they know that in this kind of a scene, they need to close their door and put something under the, the uh, you know, under the door, crack of the door on the bottom and so on, so that this, this, these fumes don't come in and open their windows so that they can breathe, you know, clean air. But you see, the guy that's caught down there, he's not only caught with the, uh, with the fog, but his eyes clamp closed. You're going to see this in a little while when we actually show you this being used for a split second outdoors because well, obviously we couldn't shoot it inside. So uh, when this fog gets shot downstairs, everything in that area stops. I mean, you know, people joke even the roaches are leaving. I mean, this is a, a very powerful, uh, literally a, a, a block between you and, and whoever's coming. They can't open the eyes for about a half an hour. They're just in a... a in limbo. And even if they can get out, even if they can possibly get out of the house, they're not strolling down the street. I mean, they've got their eyes clamped. Uh, there's an ultraviolet dye that's in there that's very, very uh, light. But under black light or an ultraviolet light, this guy, if he's caught in the police station, he'll glow. I mean, you're talking about a way that if you're, you come down to it and this guy's in the house and you've got no other way of stopping him, you shoot, shoot a fogger. You don't have to shoot it in his face. You just get it down in that area inside a building and everything, the whole floor, we're not talking about just the room it goes into, that whole floor within seconds is engulfed. And it, it's a very effective way to stop someone. Uh, we've talked a lot about this criminal coming in in the middle of the night. How about when a criminal comes in during the middle of the day or when everyone's awake or when family members are home? Uh, this is a very frequent problem. Uh, sometimes it happens at a party. You're all out back with your friends in, in the backyard. The guy knows it. He comes in the house. He rips you off while you're in the house. Somebody comes walking into the house from the backyard, you know, in the midst of this and just walks into the scene where the, the husband and wife, let's just say, are, are uh, in the den and they're literally having, you know, they're watching TV and they're getting thirsty and, the drink, and they want to drink. Well, in the middle of the, uh, the, the commercial, the wife says, you know what, I'm going to get something to drink, honey. You want something? She goes upstairs. And the next thing he hears is she's screaming. Somebody's screaming at her. And now he's in a predicament. You know, he's not supposed to become, you know, a witness to this scene, but he's also the husband. And he's also, you know, wanting to take care of her. And he's in a pretty bad scene. He, he shouldn't come into it. But at the same time, you know, he, where, what's he supposed to do? Well, uh, we could have uh, 630 at night. Dad's coming home from work. Mom's in the kitchen cooking. Kids are all home. Dad's not home yet. The 18-year-old son, of course, you know, is smarter than the rest of the world, so he left the door open as many times as he told him not to. And this uh, criminal comes intruding right into your house, living room, dining room, comes up to you in the kitchen, assaults you, you know, assaults you, puts your head back, gun to your head. And what's your natural response going to be besides to freak? Obviously, you're just you're going to be in a position where you're going to start screaming. If you start screaming a code to your family, like, help, get out, get out, there's somebody here. He knows other people are home. If you scream, code blue, code blue, that's not a very good idea either because it's telling them that there's others in the house. But if you responded the way you naturally would, which is if somebody stuck a gun up to your head, your normal response is going to be, all right, man, don't shoot, don't shoot, put the gun away, don't shoot, take anything you want, just don't shoot, put the gun away. Well, if your family has a, a discussion, this is called planning, and your discussion is ahead of time, say to, this, to the family, look, if you ever hear, don't hurt me, just don't shoot, just do, take anything you want, just don't shoot, don't hurt me, that's never a game in the house. That's a planned code, a sign or a signal, and it's telling your family, get out, call the police, just don't come into the scene because then I have witnesses, possible hostages, because the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to faint. In other words, the person who's caught with the gun to their head screams the code, drops down, falls against the guy, is laying on the floor, eyes closed, holds the breath. I'll explain about holding the breath in a minute. And literally is just sitting there on the floor, laying out, eyes closed. Don't look at the guy. Most important, don't look at this guy. And the guy typically will take the earrings if it's a woman, the watch, whatever, the jewelry, and go rob the house. Or be freaked thinking he killed you from a heart attack and split. But most of the time just leaves you alone because you're no longer of any help. In fact, what you did was you messed up his plan because now he can't use you to tell you where things are. Well, if your family has gotten out and called the police, that's great. At least they're safe. 
The guy goes, let's say he goes upstairs to rob your stuff, get out of the house. Just pick up and get out of the house. Well, we're sort of in a, in, a, in a bad scene here because you really don't know when you're laying there on the floor if there's one guy or two guys or three guys. So if you're laying on the floor, just stay there. Just stay laying on the floor. If other people are home, they're going to literally take, because of the, the plan, a fogger from whatever floor. That's why it's important that a fogger be on each floor. And if they know that they can't help you, but they know that you're in trouble, they just take the fogger, get as close to the scene as they can without entering the scene, and just fog the area. When they fog the area, remember, you're laying on the ground, your eyes are closed, you're holding your breath, and within seconds, this guy is coughing his brains out, his eyes are clamped shut. You pick yourself up right away and get out. You can find your way out of your house with your eyes closed and holding your breath and all that. The worst thing that happens is you can't hold your breath anymore, so you take some in. You're going to recover. That's why the police and the FBI use it, because it's natural cayenne pepper. It's not a chemical or anything like that, and it wears off. The issue here is if there's a plan and the code signal or the code word is given, you know to get out, the other people know to get out, not to come into the scene. And let's face it, if you don't have a code, tell the truth. Is your family going to come in if they hear you going, don't hurt me, take anything you want, just don't hurt me. You know it. They'll come right into the scene. Now you got hostages, witnesses, you got to make a plan. not knowing when he's going to hit, how he's going to hit, if he's going to hit. And it's, it's always a 24-hour day paranoia. It happens a lot more often than people want to think it does. And when it happens to them, oh, you know, nothing's really going to happen. And uh, it's just, you really got to be careful who you're, who you're with. And I thought to myself, if I could just get to my house, because I could see my house, so it was like half a block. But he came across and he cut me off right in the front of my path. And then he, and he had something in his hand. It appeared to be a gun. We quickly realized that this was a very threatening situation when we saw a gun, probably about that size, facing us. Uh, and this guy meant business. He, the impact of it was uh, the sense of the violation, that here we are in our safe neighborhood, and any young punk can just come along and, and not just threaten our, our money, our material uh, possessions, but our, you know, our, our sense of comfort and well-being and security in the neighborhood. When we're talking now about the streets, you know, you, you really need to be aware on the streets that uh, most of the people who you're going to be attacked by are drunk or high, psychotic. I mean, these are just people who nowadays, let's just talk about it, with the moral decay of the country, we've got a lot of crazies out there. And you really don't want to be in a position where you're trying to be a hero. Uh, the old days of giving them the money and, and you know, it just, it, it's left alone. Sometimes that works, but many times it doesn't. Uh, and that's unfortunate. There's not something magical that we really can do about that. But, you know, if you really think about it, there are things. There's a, a police detective on uh, public, public TV that does a very good program. And he talks about having money separate in your pocket. And you take that money out of your pocket and you hold it up to the guy. In other words, not in your wallet, but in your pocket. You hold it up, you show it to the guy, and you throw it to the right and you beat it to the left. If the guy wanted to kill you, he would have just shot you there. He's not interested in killing you. He asked you for your money. So give him the money, throwing it in one direction, running in the other. The only problem is don't do that at night. Because if you do that at night, he doesn't see you holding up money. All he sees is a sudden motion, and if he wants to hurt you or shoot you or whatever, he may just feel like he's being assaulted or something and, and, and shoot. You know, there's another issue here, and that's if somebody's trying to take you from where you are and drag you into a car or whatever they're trying to do. In other words, trying to take you to what's called a secondary crime scene. The chances of you getting out of that car on the other end and living through the scene are virtually nil. They're not zero, but they're close to it. So you need to be able to, to respond to him very quickly, very rapidly. If he's grabbing you, that means he's close enough for you to respond. Don't give him the old headbutt, you know, the, 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 the jab in the side, although those things may work. If the guy's close enough to you that his feet are right there, stamp on his feet. You don't need, he you don't need high heels to stamp on his feet. You've dropped a bar of soap on your toe in the shower. Now that soap has a, a distance of three, four feet to drop to hit your toe. And most of us have done that and know that this is a three to four ounce bar of soap that kills your foot when it lands on it. 
Middle of the night, you get up out of bed, you need to go to the bathroom, you walk around the bed, you just nick your toe. You just scrape your shin on the edge of the bed. You open up your refrigerator, your freezer, and out, out falls this piece of meat. Now this piece of meat feels like it's a two ton, megaton bomb when it hits your foot, when in reality it's a half a pound, it's a pound, it's two pounds. Your feet and your shins, you've fallen up the stairs, you know how sensitive they are. Somebody's dragging you somewhere, immediately kick back into the shins. Slam down on the feet. If you put your hand out in front of you while, while I'm talking to you and you feel these bones right here, they're, they're the same bones. If you make this your shin and your bones of your feet, many shoes are hard up front. But if you came slamming down with your bare foot on this, this part of the body, you're going to break those bones. You're going to hurt this guy really badly. And the point is that you need to break free and run and don't scream help or rape scream fire. People come out to protect their house from fire, to see what's going on, where's the fire, where are the fire trucks, you need to be able to scream fire. If you have a personal alarm that you can reach down and pull on, you just pull it and a half a mile away they hear this thing screaming. And it typically changes the guy's mind because he's, he's become the center of attention. Let's move into a building now for a moment and let's deal with an elevator. Uh, one of the interesting things about elevators is we all use them. We get onto this elevator, the doors close, and we're in a private place, either by ourselves or with someone else. What happens very frequently um, is you'll be going up to an elevator, you'll be standing there alone waiting to get on the elevator, the door is open, and there's a guy already on the elevator. And you look at this guy and, um, you know, the little hairs on the back of your head stand up, or you just get this feeling, and God didn't give you those little hairs on the back of your head just to... Uh, tell you nothing. He's trying to tell you don't get on the elevator. Well, if you ever get the feeling, you know, one thing you need to do is to learn to trust your instincts is don't get on. Well, you're on the elevator and you're there and on comes this person and you're not comfortable. You know, you can just as easily get off the elevator and just, oh, I forgot my keys or something and just get off the elevator. But there's, there's going to be that time when you're on the elevator and uh, seven people are on there and then four people and then three people and then you're left with this one guy. And it's really, again, if you're not feeling comfortable, your choice. You do have choices of where you stand on the elevator. And most people, especially if they get on alone, will get on the elevator, move to the back wall, sit back there, look up at the lights, and wait for the lights to go like that's the only enter entertainment on the elevator. Um, you need to stay by the buttons. You always need to stand by the buttons. And if you're ever uh, feeling attacked or you are being attacked, the first reflex most people have is to hit the stop button or the alarm button. Well, if you think about it, how fast do you think someone's going to be able to come and get that elevator started while you're inside, move it up a floor to open the doors to help you? Not very quickly. So if you're being attacked, you always wanted to hit all the buttons when you were a kid anyway. Just hit all the floor buttons. And what that does is it keeps taking his privacy away by opening the elevator on each floor. So again, don't hit the stop. You may hit the alarm if the elevator keeps going, but don't hit the stop button. Hit every floor button you can. The issue, screaming your lungs out so that when that door opens, wherever you are, whether it's an office building, an apartment building, everyone hears what's going on. Again, you should be screaming fire. If you have one of the personal alarms that uh, we'll, we'll be showing you, you just pull the pin on that thing and it's almost impossible to stay on the elevator because your ears are killing you on the elevator. Well, continuing on to your purse. Uh, if you're out on the street in your purse, there's a few different ways to wear it. Most women will just put it over their shoulder and walk. And if you put it over your shoulder and walk, anybody that's got any, any reason to take it just comes flying up, it's gone, and you could chase the guy. It's very rare you're going to get it back. Sometimes, uh, especially if you're feeling threatened, you'll put it over, your, over the top and bring it across the front of you. Well, you've heard that many times. The only problem is if the guy takes it and pulls, he's going to be pulling on your, around your neck and you're going to get hurt. And that's not necessary. The best way to wear your bag is to take off your outer garment, a sweater or whatever it is that you're wearing, put it underneath so that it's under your clothing and then put your clothing on. Bring the bag into the front of you here so that the bag can't be seen from the rear, the strap is invisible. As far as he can tell, you're not even wearing anything and even if he wanted to get it off of you, he's got to virtually undress you to get this whole thing off. There's lots of other people walking down the street with the bags bouncing off their butt that they can just take it and run. The personal alarm that you saw on the uh, door earlier, that alarm also comes with an item that you can either wrap around your wrist that, that you hold on to, clip to a belt, and you put it on your bag. And that same alarm, if the guy tries to take off with your bag, 
he's in for a surprise because there's a 130 decibel screamer on your bag. And as he runs, he's immediately the center of attention and typically just drops the bag and takes off. It's your choice. People ask all the time about defensive sprays. Uh, there's many on the market. Years ago, it was very easy to pick a defensive spray because there was two or three. Uh, uh, brand name Mace, everybody's heard of. Uh, the tear gas, uh, pepper sprays, they're all there. They're all in the market. Uh, paperwork that you'll be getting with this video will really clearly define the different varieties. Let me give an overview quickly. Uh, first of all, uh, the Mace type units that do not have pepper spray in them, uh, the tear gas units, if the person that you shoot it with is drunk and not feeling pain, is high and not feeling pain, is psychotic and not feeling pain, the issue being the pain. If they're not feeling pain, you shoot them. If I took my glasses off and you shot me with a tear gas right smack in my face and I was drunk or blown away on drugs or whatever, it would have no effect on me because I'm not feeling the pain. When a pepper spray hits you, depending upon its strength, it causes basically an involuntary reflex. You have a closure of the eyes, uh, even if you're drunk or high, it doesn't matter. The eyes just close. When you breathe it in, it causes the, the, what it actually does in reality is it causes the capillaries in your eyes and your mouth and your nose to expand. So it's feeling like you can't breathe, when in reality you can breathe, it's just very difficult. It's sort of like an asthma attack. Um, the eyes, even if you could keep them open for a second, you can't see through them because the capillaries in the eyes are all uh, blown up. So the pepper sprays are obviously the newest and hottest thing out there. It was pretty unbearable. I mean, it felt like both my eyes were being you know, seared with hot irons, like red hot irons. Um, it was really, really painful. I couldn't breathe. My nose was, was running. All the, the mucus was coming out. Um, I just, I tried to open my eyes a couple times and I mean, as soon as I just barely got them open, the, the pain was intolerable. The, the most important thing to me was getting it off. Um, I just never thought it could be that bad. And uh, I mean, if I was really trying to get the person who sprayed me, I wouldn't, you know, that became irrelevant very quickly. Um, the, cl the only thing I wanted to do was get down on the ground and get, get it off, get it off, you know, whatever w would have been in my mind was meaningless. The pain was just uh, unbearable. And I mean, if, if I came into a situation like that, I would definitely, uh, I would use it. I'd want it at my side because it works it, great. The filmer which we're going to show you, we're going to shoot on a dummy because we really didn't want to shoot Tom who happens to be a personal friend of mine and was, uh, I guess, crazy enough to make this video and actually do this for me and I appreciate it. Uh, we're going to shoot it on a dummy's head. And you're going to see that the foam, uh, there's two things about it. One, it, like most of the sprayers, comes out in a stream, similar to a water pistol. The difference is, and this is a real issue with the sprayers, is when you shoot somebody with a direct stream, you don't necessarily see what you're doing. The reason that we're using the police foam is, one, it's two million heat units of the hottest pepper there is, which is habanero peppers. And when this habanero pepper hits you, there's nothing to discuss. The hardest part to understand about this, the personal sprays is how to use them. Many people think that these sprays can be used from great distances. Um, in fact, many of them are advertised as such, and some of them can be used at distances. Uh, the type that people carry with them in their, in their pants pocket, in their purses, is a half an ounce. Now, if you think about a half an ounce of spray in a canister that's about three quarters of an ounce in size, you have very little pressure pushing. And even though, yes, they can go six feet, eight feet, 10 feet, there's also something called the wind. And if you're shooting something like a water pistol in this direction and the wind's coming in this direction, then it's just gonna spatter over here. Well, A, if you can't see it, you don't know that. The farther you are, the less chance you have of getting it on the person. And if being on their clothes isn't gonna matter, it matters what's in his nose, eyes, and his mouth. So you need to be fairly close to a person when you shoot this. Oh. What most people do is they take their hand, they come up with their hand with a spray in their hand, and they shoot. And when this was done on 2020, what they did is many times the hand was grabbed, take it off to the side, the new thing was taken and, fre and frequently used on the, the personnel. The natural reflex of somebody coming at you is if you were to punch them or put your fingernails right towards their face, 
their natural reflex, if it was coming at me, would be to back away like this and to try to get that hand or that fist out of their face. It's a natural reflex. If that hand coming up is a spray, that's why the spray is either grabbed or pushed out of the way and not shot. So if you decoy by using the other hand first, right to the face, the opposite from where the spray is, right to the face, and the, sp the second they go after it, you take the spray right up their body, right from the center, just like a police officer learns to shoot, right up the center, up their mouth, up their nose, and it's in their eyes, and you've got them because they went after the decoy, and that's how to use a spray so that you, you're, you're definitely getting the guy and not taking, getting it taken from you. In all instances when you use a spray, you never use the spray and stand there. You use the spray and you take off. I was shopping and I came out to my car and there was a van parked next to my car. And as I was getting in the car, this guy jumped out from behind the van and, and he, was, he, he attacked me. And he was screaming at me and he was hitting me and he was demanding the keys to my car. And I fought him. I, I, I didn't know any better. I, all I knew was you know, to protect myself and d defend myself and he was just screaming at me. And then he, he put me in the trunk of my car. Carjacking scene, it's really quite easy to keep your car if you think the scene through and again you plan for it ahead of time. Uh, I personally don't like what I'm about to tell you because it's sort of my own personal admission uh, to myself. I walk around with two sets of keys. I have a set of keys and on that set is the door lock to my car and all the other keys, and I don't have any idea what they are anymore. We all have those. You know, the keys, we don't know where they came from, what, did, what they go to. Well, on the one ring is my door lock key and all these other keys. If I'm attacked, I don't argue with the guy. I certainly don't turn around and look at him. I don't get involved in any kind of a tussle. I just give him the keys and I let him get in my car. Why? Because when he gets in the car, what he recognizes after he's in the car and after I've taken off is that he doesn't have the key to my ignition. By the way, if the key to your ignition is the same as the key to your door, you can go to your typical uh, auto parts store and for $15 to $20, they will change the tumblers in your door lock so that you have a separate door lock and a separate tumblers for your ignition. Anyway, all, all he's been given is the key to my door lock. He has not been given the keys to my car. He has not been given the keys to the club on the steering wheel. He has not been given the keys to uh, my house. So when he goes into my glove compartment, as most people keep their insurance or their some kind of document registration, something they bought with their address, your book when you bought the, the car brand new, you put your address in there, never keep anything in the glove compartment that has your address or anywhere in the car. Because once the guy gets in and realizes that you had a plan and that he has nothing, if he wants to find out where you live, don't make it easy for him. You can hide the registration and insurance in your trunk. You can pull your ashtray out, tape it underneath the ashtray, put the ashtray back in, buy your tapes. There's a million places that you can hide your registration and insurance. Interestingly enough, uh, when, when the scene goes down, if you're with a person, and that person, and this again comes all down to planning, is not taught not to look at the individual, if you've never said to your child, for instance, if we're ever going up to our car and mommy just gives the key away or daddy just gives the key away, don't ever look back. Because when you look back, you become a witness. And this guy doesn't want a witness. So if you're going to do this, you take off, you run, and you don't look back. And don't worry, the guy's not going anywhere with your car unless he's a pro. And if he's a pro, he's, not, he's going to take your car anyway. Okay, so summarizing. One set of keys is your door lock and any other keys you want to put on there, but not your house keys, not your ignition key, nothing that this guy can deal with you on. The other set, which after you get in the car, you take your second set of keys out, you start the car, of course you take your club if you have that, alarms that you may have, disengage them, they're all on the second set and they're never out of your pocket till you're in the car, you lock the car. Obviously, as I said earlier, when you're coming back to your car, it depends on planning ahead of time. Did I park in an area that it's now dark and I'm in pitch black? If you think ahead and you just park your car somewhere where it's lit, you have a much better chance of being lit that the guy doesn't want to be seen in the out, in, you know, in the open like that. Um, 
look under the car, look in the back seat. Again, these are all things that you're either going to do or you're not going to do, and it's always the same issue. You know, I never thought this would happen, I never thought that would happen. As far as car theft, it's difficult to keep any car from being stolen. If somebody wants your car, they're going to get your car. If they're a pro, it doesn't matter what device you have on that car. If they want your car, they're going to get your car. Well, there's a lot of little things that you can do because, again, the majority of people are not the pros who are taking the cars. And don't, by the way, make the mistake, oh, I got one of these old clunkers. Who wants my car? Oh, they can have my car. Many people say that until they lose their car and they wind up having these big payments and everything else that they now have to deal with. Older cars in good condition are good for parts, and they're not making those parts in good condition anymore. So don't kid yourself about your older car. Um, with regard to the, to the safety of the car, there are tow trucks now that come up to the, to the car, and, and the thieves have them. They pull the car, they pull the, the uh, tow truck up. There's two forks that stand out. They bend out, they pick up your front tires or your rear tires, and they make off with your car, and it takes seconds. Well. If your car, when you get out of your car, you put your emergency brake on, when they lift up the front of the car, it's very hard to drag it because obviously the brakes are on. If before you get out of the car, again, all planning, you turn your wheel all the way to the right or the left, and of course it locks in place. They're dragging the car like this from the back. If it's turned to the side, it's doing this as they're trying to pull it. So again, it's very something very simple that you can do. Um, again, parking in places are, that are obvious those types of things you, you do. But then, if a guy wants your car and you've invested in a car alarm, uh, we have an interesting thing that we do in the seminar is we actually go to, uh, that we get the whole room to stand up. And there could be hundreds of people in the room or there could be 25 people in the room. And we ask everybody in the room if they've ever heard a car alarm go off that was not on their street. In other words, while they were at the mall, they were uh, at the movies, they were in town, they were at their job. And everybody says, yes, I've heard a car alarm go off there. Now, not on your street, ask yourself this question. When you hear a car alarm go off, do you turn around? Do you look? Do you call the police? Do you go confront the guy? In most cases, when you hear an alarm because they're going off all the time, whether they're false alarms, you know, or whatever, you know, people don't go up and confront a guy. They don't turn around and say, oh, it looks like maybe that car's being stolen, because they figure it must be the guy getting in his own car. So the issue here is, when alarms go off outside the car, what we do in this group is we ask everyone to stand up and all of those people who have ever, when they were away from their house and heard an alarm go off, if they ever confront the guy, if they ever literally immediately pick up their car phone, pay phone, store phone and call the police, we ask them all to keep standing. But if they never called the police and they never confronted the guy, sit down, 99.9% .9 of the time everyone in the room sits down and they laugh. And they're laughing sort of at their self and what they're realizing is, Car alarms in larger areas where they're going off all the time just aren't very effective. Now, I mean, let me take this back a minute and understand. On your street, most people, when they hear it go off, unless it's going off every 20 minutes, people will look out, especially the owner. But away from the house, they've really lost their effect. So in dealing with a car alarm on TV, there was many, many, many of these were sold on TV. There's an alarm that actually rings in the car that requires no permanent installation. So you can move it from car A to car B. And what this car alarm does is it's just like a cassette deck. If you have a cassette, and we'll assume that for this first part of this conversation, you plug it into your cassette. When you plug it in, you turn it on, and three things happen. One, the alarm starts a 30-second countdown. That's giving you 30 seconds to get away from the car. Two, the alarm locks. When you turn the key on, you're, you're dropping a deadbolt into the cassette so that the car alarm cannot now be taken out. It's physically locked into the cassette. Three, you've got a, the motion sensor is, being, is getting ready to be armed. So after the 30 seconds is up, you've gotten away from the car. Anything that disturbs the car, there's a 10 second countdown. The reason there's 10 second countdown is that when you come back to the car, you need time to get in and put your key in and turn it off. Well, if it's not you, the typical criminal will take a few seconds to get in. He gets in the car. He hears this toot, toot, toot beeping sound. If he doesn't have the key to that alarm, Within a matter of just a couple, couple few seconds, this alarm at 130 decibels is ringing in the car and warbling and compressing his eardrums so, in, so intently, he's not staying in the car. It doesn't wake the neighborhood up if it goes off by accident. You know what's interesting is that many times, even though this alarm has a sensitivity on the back, so you can turn the sensitivity to vibration up or down, 
many times a big truck, boom, hits the street where you live in an area where lots of trucks or a heavy rainstorm or hail's hitting the car and you know it wakes every, all the neighbors up or it's going off every two seconds. This alarm not only has a sensitivity adjustment, but after the alarm goes off, if it was a false alarm, the way it knows that is that there's no more vibration for 20 seconds. In other words, it evaluates every 20 seconds and if for 20 seconds there's no vibration, it shuts down, resets itself, and then the next thing that happens, the next vibration against that car, it'll go off again. So that it actually isn't ringing. You don't have to come down out of your house. If it's the middle of the night, go down, turn the thing off, hope the, the neighbors don't kill you for waking them up. It's a very effective, very sophisticated, has a steel bar running straight through it, a steel bolt that drops into the, to the cassette itself. If you don't have a cassette deck, you can still use it by just mounting it underneath the dash. You flip it upside down, and you drill three holes under the dash. Two to mount the unit with, you just drill right through the, the cassette part itself. And where the, but where the steel bar comes up, you need to give it a space to come up to. And when you see it in front of you, you'll understand. When you use, the, when you use it that way, uh, when you sell your car, you just need to take out the couple bolts and move it to the next car. When you use it in the cassette, even if you have more than one car, you can move it from cassette from car to car. So you're only making a one-time purchase and it goes with you from that point on. One of the most effective things besides the noise in the car is that it's constantly blinking in the car and the guy knows that your car is armed. There's also stickers for the window. So the car alarm is a very um, overused item and people don't care anymore. This particular alarm that we, we've uh, found, we find it to be very effective for you. I think one of the toughest parts of my job as the founder and co-founder of this, this uh, company is really trying to convince the person in front of me to make a plan. Uh, people realistically don't plan to fail. They just fail to plan. And if you really don't have this plan made ahead of time, you will fail in a real crime scene. Here you've watched things, you've heard about them. Uh, it's unfortunate because I go into, and my people go into major corporations, we talk to hundreds of people uh, at a time, and it's amazing that we're all the same, we all do the same things, and it's a very sad uh, testimony that we do the same things. It's because we watch TV and we've heard different things and our parents taught us certain things, but when it really comes down to crime, we really don't know much. Uh, and we really need to, to have a, a unified plan, and that's what this film has been about. I really do hope that you'll take the time right now. Uh, we're going to be leaving you with a planner, and that planner will make your plan specific for you different than for your neighbor, for your sister, for your aunt, for your uncle, because depending upon the style home that you live in, how many people you live with, if you live alone, your plan is going to be different than other people's. So I do hope that you will take this to heart, that you'll make an effort immediately to change and to do, to do the things, as many of them as you can do, uh, that you've seen on this video and take advantage of them. My sincere desire is that you really will never need any of this information. But the fact is that most of you will at some point. The Lord has given us this business. He's blessed us with it. And we hope that uh, we've been a blessing to you. And I thank you for listening.